recently had a brother uh, send me a little brochure here about the 33rd annual um, Dean Bergen Society conference rejoicing in the 400th anniversary of our King James Bible and he said you know are you gonna be at this thing I said probably not um, it's uh, Collingswood New Jersey July 27th through the 28th 2011 from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. so a lot of speakers and uh, this is not a thing where I'm gonna be attacking these guys or anything much uh, but there are some things in here that, that bother me, and I just want to share those with you. There's a lot of great men that are going to be at this thing, and I support a lot of what they're doing, but there are some very serious errors in here as well. So let me show you some of those. Okay, here we have the little uh, brochure uh, celebrating the 400th anniversary of our King James Bible. Let's open it up. Now, right away, I have a problem. Revelation 1.9b, for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Revelation 1.9. says here, for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. But now look at the spelling here. Word. Word. This is the manifest word right here. That's a reference to the written word. So you see, right away they're changing the word of God. It's not talking about Jesus Christ here. It's talking about the written word of God. So right away we have a change made to the King James Bible. See, you can stand, you can say, I stand for the perfect word of God. And it's a, it's a trick that these scholar guys will do. They'll say the perfect word of God, and they'll make it a capital W, and in their minds they know that they're referring to Jesus Christ, but not referring to the written word of the King James Bible. So right there I have a problem with that. But then over here we have the Bible. And it goes into the fact of, you know, we believe the Bible and, and all this other stuff. Um, which I'll get into that in another video. The thing about inspiration, the meaning of inspiration, the confusion, a lot of the confusion is over the definition of what is inspired. Okay, and then here they talk about the Masoretic Hebrew and the traditional Greek text of the New Testament, uh, Textus Receptus. But now look at this. We believe that the King James Version or Authorized Version of the English Bible is A, true, not the you know, definitive article, it's just A. You know, there might be other ones. A true, faithful, and accurate translation of these two providentially preserved texts, which I have some issues there too, which in our time has no equal among all the other English translations. The translators did such a fine job in their translation task that we can, without apology, now here you're going to see a lie, hold up the authorized version of 1611 and say this is the... Word of God. Now, it's, if it's the Word of God, then it cannot contain any errors or you can't question it. Otherwise, God is of less intellect than you are or, you know, God lied, which is ridiculous. But it says here, they say, this is the Word of God, while at the same time realizing that in some verses we must go back to the underlying original language text for complete clarity and also compare scripture with scripture. Compare scripture with scripture, what, what does that mean? You see? You see the double standard. Okay? Yea, hath God said. That's what's going on here. That's, this is very, very bad. This is very evil right here. If you're holding it up and saying this is the word of God, how can you turn around and say that there are places where it should, you know, we got to go back to the original language text. You see the hypocrisy here? The Bible talks about there would come those in the last days departing from the faith, and, and it says about how that they would speak lies in hypocrisy. Well, right there, you talk about lie and hypocrisy. This is the Word of God, but not really. It's not perfect. Okay? 
That's very, very uh, bothering to me. Let me zoom back out here a little bit. A lot of different men speaking here. And, you know, a lot of it looks like it'd be, you know, pretty good. There are some good men that are coming, uh, definitely. A lot of these men, I would, you know, defend their work. But there are two that I want to warn about. And ironically, they're related. Dangers of an inspired King James Bible position. Okay, uh, there's no danger to that. All right, the King James Bible is the inspired Word of God. It's just the question comes over that word right there, inspired. How do you define that word? You can listen to uh, some of Stephen Schutt's material on that. Uh, that's some good stuff on there. Okay, that's not something I'd agree with. I do believe the King James Bible is inspired. Does the King James Bible replace the Hebrew and Greek? And there you have D.A. Wait. Here you have a man who's a scholar, and I'm sorry, but I believe that this guy has a problem with King James Bible believers having authority over someone like him. See, he's a scholar. He likes to hold himself up above you because he knows Greek and Hebrew. And to have some righteous redneck come out and be preaching the Word of God and saying, this is this King James Bible that I hold in my hands, this is the perfect Word of God. People like that don't like that. They like to hold the fact that they know Hebrew and Greek above the other people, above the laity. See, I have a big problem with that. But let me just ask a question. Okay, or let's look at his question here. Does the King James Bible replace the Hebrew and Greek? Well, why don't we answer that? There you have Revelation chapter 1. Here we have the uh, Textus Receptus. Let's look at verse 18 here. Here you have verse 18. There's verse 18. Now how many of you can read that? How many of you, is this any good at all to you? I mean, how many of you can look at this and be blessed by that? How about that? I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus Christ speaking there in that verse. That's a blessing. What's this? You say, well, it's Greek to me. <laughs> yeah. But let's go back and look at the inspired Old Testament. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Look at that. You know, here, let's, let's compare some, some more Scripture with Scripture. What's easier to understand, here or there? So you say, uh, over here, does the King James Bible replace the Hebrew and Greek? I would say that's a definite yes. Where has, what, how many souls has this text, or the Greek, how many souls have been led to Jesus Christ in the last 400 years by this? How many street preachers take this thing out and crank that thing open and, hey brother, let me show you here, let me show you the path of salvation. Here, let's go back to the New Testament here. Look at this. Look at, look at how Jesus died for you. And people look at that and they'd say, what? But you can go to your King James Bible and you can say, here, read this. What's this say? Has the King James Bible replaced the Hebrew and the Greek? Absolutely. Now let me just state for the record here, I don't consider D.A. Waite to be a heretic, okay? I don't condemn the man as far as being, I don't think he's really saved or something. No, no, no. No, nothing like that. Uh, I actually have uh, his book right here, D.A. Waite's one book. And it's interesting because it's called Defending the King James Bible. It's not called Defending the Texas Receptus. Defending the King James Bible. Kind of peculiar. But uh, I'm sure this would be a good conference to go to. You probably learned some things. Me personally, well, I just don't have time for it. I'm way too busy. I don't do much traveling. Uh, I got plenty to do right here. But uh, I just, man, I have a real problem with somebody that tries to defend these two dead languages. I mean, the Hebrew, it's not technically dead because, you know, there's still Jews out there and Orthodox Jews probably speak Hebrew. 
Uh, I'm not cutting on that at all. But what I'm saying is God stopped using those languages a long time ago. Okay, to bless people, to lead people to himself. Right there. Proofs of history. The greatest book that ever showed up on this planet is this King James Bible. That's not my opinion. That's a fact documented over and over and over again. No book, book, no book in history has been printed and published as much as this King James Bible. None of them. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm just starting to learn about this. I, you get busy, you know, in ministry and you don't have much time to study. But I'm studying it. I'm going to put a lot of more time into studying this. This King James Bible is not based 100% on the Texas Receptus. <gasps> not a big deal. You see, because the King James Bible is actually based on ancient Bible translations as well. And if you say, well, it, it has to come exactly from the Greek. Really? Well, maybe you ought to read Acts chapter 2 sometime. In the first century, right when the church was getting started, God was already having the apostles speaking in other languages, also called tongues. Holy Spirit inspired speaking in other languages. So don't give me this thing of, well, it has to be the Greek. No, not necessarily. Now, the King James Bible is, you know, the best translation of what we have is the Textus Receptus, but to, to come out and say that the Textus Receptus is somehow perfect and the authority, well, I'd have to challenge you and say, which one? You see, there are multiple editions of the Textus Receptus, and there are multiple editions of the Nestle's text, and any other Greek text. And you know what else? It gets worse. Okay, this Textus Receptus here, I recently learned from Gail Ripplinger's one book, I've been studying this issue, this edition of the Textus Receptus was edited by Scrivener, one of the men on the Westcott and Hort translation team of 1881, the revised version translation team. And Scrivener, a lot of it follows the Textus Receptus of Stephanus, but there are places where he changed the text to read like the Alexandrian manuscripts. So, you know, for a while, I was making the mistake of thinking that this is the Texas Receptus that the King James translators used. It isn't. Okay? This thing isn't even 200 years old. And by the way, oh, the Greek over here, the Nestles, this thing is probably not even 30 or 40 years old. Isn't that amazing? People will come along and they'll try to overthrow a book that's been around for almost 400 years as far as, you know, 1769, you know, what we have now. But 400 years ago is when this thing was translated. See the 1611 or 1769 video. There were different editions of this simply because of spelling changes and whatever. But the text of this thing has been around for 400 years now. And yet you come along, one of these wicked apostates comes along and they pick up a corrupted Greek text like this that's not even 40 years old and they come out and they say this King James Bible is not accurate to the Greek text and they're referring to a book that's less than you know a quarter of the age of the King James Bible and you say yes but it's a, it's compiled from you know the best available Greek manuscripts no let me explain that too a lot of people have the faulty notion that this Greek text stuff is they find a ancient Greek whole Bible and then they take it and they put it into a convenient book like this. You know, they find a bunch of scrolls or something like that. That isn't it. The Greek text that we have today, both Receptus and the Alexandrian, both of them are made usually by one or two men or maybe a couple of them. And they take samples of Greek manuscripts that were found and then they put them together into what they believe is the Greek text. And I'm going to tell you something else that's shocking. The Texas Receptus comes from the Greek Orthodox Church. 
the Alexandrian comes from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it's kind of like going to, you know, dumb or dumber, you know, for your Bible. See, the King James Bible has readings in it from not only Greek, but also from ancient Bible translations, which predate a lot of these Greek Bibles or these Greek manuscripts, Greek translations and things, Greek texts, okay? And you say, well then, how can we really be sure that we have the Word of God by the fruit it bears? And people say, oh, you know, that's not really a test. Oh, come on. Come on. If I told you directions to some place and it worked out, you would say, well, yeah, he knew what he was talking about. But if I told you directions to some place and you followed my directions and you got lost and it took you to some place that wasn't even close to where you were going, you could easily say, well, then he lied to me. Now, the claims that this King James Bible makes, the prophecies given in it, they bear fruit, spiritual fruit. Okay, And if you go out and you believe this King James Bible is the word of God, God will bless you. And he'll do th um, just amazing, magnificent things through your life because of the King James Bible. This isn't just a common, ordinary book. This is God's book. I've proved it over and over and over and over again with my own life experiences. And you can prove it too, by the way. You know, like the old story that I've told in different sermons about the old farm woman that she would put a T and a P beside the verses. And a pastor said, what's that about? Why are you putting TP there? And she said it means tested and proved. Amen. I can attest to that. <laughs> These new versions, it's the spirit in them is just wrong. I mean, it's just so messed up. This King James Bible, it is amazing. You'll be going through something in your life and you'll be reading your the King James Bible and your devotions and all of a sudden you'll hit a verse and it's just like, that is exactly what I'm going through right now. Why? Because this book is written by God. This is God's book. So, oh no, there were 54 translators in it. Yeah, uh-huh. Yep, sure. But God used them to write down what he wanted. Well, I don't believe that way. Okay, then go back to your Greek. Go back and say, I believe in the Greek and Hebrew, and since you don't know it like I do, you have to come to me for the truth. Okay? And, you know, I'll say one other thing about D.A. Waite. I've heard the guy preach when he preaches directly from the King James Bible and he, you know, lifts it up as the Word of God. He preaches very well. I've been blessed many times by the, some of his sermons. I mean, it's, he does a good job. But there's still that part of him that just, you know, doesn't want to let go of this. Because, you see, the common man can come along and get blessed from this book. But you can't control the common man if we're all given the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to guide us into understanding this book. The Spirit of Truth will guide you into all truth. You can't control people that way. So how do you control them? By holding up something difficult that they can't understand, that the man on the street can't be blessed out of. Give them something archaic like this. And that's another thing. You know, oh, the King James Bible is too hard to understand. What is it that we have then as the final authority? Greek and Hebrew. Boy, that makes sense. Yeah, that's intelligent. So, I'm going to be doing some more videos on this subject in the future. But, as always, if you've watched my videos, you know my stand. You know, you don't agree with me and you want to argue and stuff. Go to some other channel. Make your own videos. Whatever. You know, I don't have time for it. But if you are a Bible believer and you want to have the authority of God's Word, right there it is. Tested, proven for 400 years. No other book has been subjected to the amount of testing and proving that this King James Bible has been through. This is the greatest book in the world and anybody that seeks to change it is a hypocrite if they turn around and call this book the Word of God. If this is the Word of God, if you say you can boldly stand up and hold this up and say this is the Word of God, if you say that, 
then you better not change it. You better not go and say, well, a more accurate reading should be, a better translation should be. You better not change it if you're calling it the Word of God. That's a sin. That's it. Thank you for watching.